Good morning, everybody. Welcome to this next wonderful bucket course event. I am delighted to introduce my friend, David Harrison, who is professor of French at the college. David came here to the college in 1999, so almost marking 20 years. He teaches French literature of the medieval, renaissance, and enlightenment periods. And his topic today is the Burgers of Calais, how a medieval battle became the basis of Auguste Rodin's masterpiece. Please welcome David. And then, let me tell you the things, that, other things I'm supposed to tell you. Please turn off your... Please turn off your phones if you haven't done that already. Please turn on your tea coil if you're using that today. And David says to me that pretty much his, his prepared remarks are probably going to end at about break time. And so after break, it's going to be question and answer and discussion. And as we've gotten used to in the last few weeks, please wait for me. Um, and potentially somebody else if we get a second microphone to come to you before you make your comment or ask your question. That's just helpful for the, for the rest of the people in the room and for the viewing audience. Um, and if you mention your name when you're uh, making your, asking your question or making your comment, that's great too. Thanks. Can, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Is it too loud? No? Well, thank you, Janet, and uh, thank you to everyone for uh, for coming. Thank you. It's really uh, a, a great pleasure to be here and to see familiar faces, uh, to have such a great uh, crowd of, uh, of, uh, of people. And I'm sure that many of you have, will have uh, or have visited places that I'll mention in the talk or have seen the artwork uh, that, I've, uh, that I'll present. Uh, because it's hard to really understand this topic without seeing visuals, I've prepared uh, a slide presentation with PowerPoint, and I think it'll uh, be best seen if we turn down the lights, um, but I still have to read, so it can't be too dark. But um, So, is that good? Okay, if, if we need more uh, resolution, we can turn the lights down uh, further. Okay, and let me make sure I've got the clicker. All right, so, um, what I'm going to talk about today is a battle that is recounted in the specific history of what was known as, or what had been called, the Hundred Years' War. And this battle inspired many artists, but led 450 years after the event to the creation of one of Auguste Rodin's most famous statues, uh, in English, the Burgers of Calais. My purpose is not only to show how Rodin gave a unique artistic interpretation to the medieval story of the Burgers, an interpretation that shocked the Calais Municipal Council that had commissioned him to do the work. But I also want to show how the story of mutual sacrifice was transformed through the years leading up to Rodin, and how the story has even been challenged by modern historians. Uh, to put it in visual terms, I want to talk about how this town on the English Channel produced uh, this story, that's, we'll come back to that, that's an image from a manuscript uh, of the particular uh, history that I'll talk about, and how that resulted in this sculpture. And I'd also like, uh, uh, time willing, to talk a bit about the city of Calais today, for it's very much in the news uh, due to the international refugee crisis, and the present situation in Calais echoes some of the, some of the themes of the story, <laughs> of the medieval burgers. Now, uh, just to give you even further organization, here's how I'm going to uh, organize this. I'm going to start by talking about uh, where Calais is and talk about the, the siege of the town in 1347 by the English king, Edward III. I'll talk about how this episode is recounted in a particular uh, medieval historian's work, uh, Jean Froissart's Chronicles of France. And I'll ask the question of whether we should trust this account before talking about how the story was transformed through the centuries uh, to become a symbol of French patriotism. Then I'll talk about Rodin's work, uh, the stages of its creation and its controversy. And finally, 
uh, I'll turn to Calais today and its present day challenges. Okay, so to begin with then, what is Calais? Uh, some of you undoubtedly have been there. It's an important port city. I have a uh, uh, laser here, so there it is right there. It's an important port city uh, on the English Channel. It's the point at which the English Channel is the narrowest between uh, England and France, and it therefore is a natural departure point for an arrival point for uh, ships and traffic. Um, it's said that, in, I've never been there myself, but it's said that in clear weather you can see the English coast from Calais. Um, and unsurprisingly, the Channel Tunnel, which I'm sure some of you have taken, uh, goes under the English Channel right there because that's where uh, the distance is the shortest. Uh, I recently learned that in fact because the distance is so uh, short here compared to the rest of the uh, Normandy coast that uh, Adolf Hitler was convinced that the invasion of France by the Allies would take place here uh, and not uh, and not further further down. But that's another story. Now in the Middle Ages Calais was also important for another reason, its proximity to uh, Flanders, which was an independently governed region that was economically very strong in the Middle Ages as a producer of textiles, often spun with wool from England. So therefore, control of Calais during the period meant control of the exports from Flanders to England, so strategically very important. Now, in the 14th century, England and France fought a series of battles motivated in part by a dispute over the succession to the French throne whether the English king, Edward III, could sort of claim rights to French territory, or whether those rights were superseded by uh, the person who was uh, then the French king, Philip VI. It's a question of, of what's called Salic law, uh, that's the term governing the succession to the French throne. And the battles that occurred as a result of that uh, question would later be called the Hundred Years' War because they lasted uh, in various forms until uh, the 15th century. Now the initial battles of this conflict took place in northern France as Edward III would land with his forces in Normandy or Brittany, raid a series of French towns and then exit back to England through another port. So for example, here's a French map that shows, uh, a contemporary French map obviously, that shows uh, the route that Edward III took in 1346 where his forces landed here and then went through uh, Normandy and didn't uh, go to Paris but then ended up in Calais which is where the, uh, the siege took place. So in 1346 Edward's for Edward III's forces surrounded Calais which had about 1300 residents. The English forces created both a land and sea blockade in order to starve the Calais residents into surrender. Surprisingly, this siege took, it continued for 11 months as the people of Calais resisted the English and hoped for relief from King Philip. But Philip eventually abandoned the city due to the strength of the English army. So, at this point, we're in August 1347, 11 months into the siege. Now let's turn to the account of the surrender of Calais, written by Jean Froissart, a medieval historian whose chronicles of the Hundred Years' War have become a key source of information about this period. Uh, and these, this was the inspiration for Rodin when conceiving his statue. Now, Froissart's version of the surrender of Calais is dramatic and suspenseful. And I'm going to go through some of the, the parts of it, and I'm going to put some of the text uh, on the screen, but I'll also read it out. Now, in Froissart's version, the residents of Calais are reduced to famine, and they're abandoned by the French king. They agree to surrender, but they plead with an envoy of the English king to ask that he show them mercy. And here's the first passage that I'd like to uh, uh, read aloud. And if you can't read it, that's why I'm going to read it aloud. After the departure of King Philip and his army, the people of Calais realized that the support on which they had been counting had failed them. And at the same time, they were so weakened by hunger that the biggest and strongest of them could hardly stand. So they took counsel together and decided it would be better to throw themselves on the mercy of the King of England if they could not attain better terms than to die by one of starvation. 
one by one of starvation, excuse me. For hunger might drive many of them frantic and cost them their souls with their bodies. Edward, hearing this demand, the King of England hearing this demand, is unmoved and inflexible. The siege of Calais has taken so long and has been so vexing that he insists that all of the residents be killed or ransomed. His barons, however, his top uh, advisors, are able to soften him a bit. The English king will spare the lives, the sp spare the citizens of Calais if six of them offer themselves to the king. And here's what the king says to his envoy. Uh, Sir Walter, go back to Calais and tell its commander that this is the limit of my clemency. Six of the principal citizens are to come out with their heads and their feet bare, halters round their necks, and the keys of the town and castle in their hands. With these six, I shall do as I please, and the rest I will spare. So, this envoy goes back to Calais, the town bell is rung, and all of the desperate Calais residents come together. Upon learning the news of the English king's offer, the residents begin weeping with such intensity, Foisau says, that anyone hearing them would have been moved by pity. Then one person steps forward and speaks. At last, the richest citizen of the town, by name Master Eustache de Saint-Pierre, stood up and said, Sirs, it would be a cruel and miserable thing to allow such a population as this to die, so long as some remedy can be found. To prevent such a misfortune would surely be an act of great merit in our Savior's eyes. And for my part, I should have such strong hopes of receiving pardon for my sins if I died to save this people, that I wish to be the first to come forward. I am willing to strip to my shirt, bare my head, put the rope round my neck, and deliver myself into the king of England's hands. A second burgher, burgher meaning simply uh, city dweller, resident of the burg, or important uh, uh, citizen, comes, the second comes forward to join him, and he's named Jean Dare. I'll show you these names in a second, the full names. Then two brothers come forward, and two more volunteer. These six men go forward, wearing only their undershirt, ropes around their neck, bearing the keys to the city and uh, the city wall and the city castle. They're brought before the king, King Edward, who's accompanied by his pregnant wife, Queen Philippa. And here's what happens, according to Massa. The king kept silent and looked at them very fair, fiercely, for he hated the people of Calais because of the losses they had inflicted on him at sea in the past. The six burghers knelt down before him, and clasping their hands in supplication said, Most noble lord and king, here before you are we six citizens of Calais, long established and wealthy merchants of the town. We surrender to you the keys of the town and the castle to do with them as you will. We put ourselves, as you see us, entirely in your hands in order to save the remaining inhabitants of Calais who have already undergone great privations. We pray you, by your generous heart, to have mercy on us also. The king is unmoved. Off with their heads. The king's own soldiers begin to cry for mercy, and the king will not listen. Finally, Queen Philippa steps forward. Then the noble queen of England, pregnant as she was, humbly threw herself on her knees before the king and said, weeping, Ah, my dear lord, since I crossed the sea at great danger to myself, you know that I have never asked a single favor from you. But now I ask you in all humility, in the name of the Son of the Blessed Mary, and by the love you bear me, to have mercy on these six men. Eureka. The queen's words and tears soften her husband's heart, and he accedes to her request. The six burghers are taken to the queen's quarters with their halters removed. They're dressed and fed and brought back to Calais but only temporarily because although their lives are spared, the Cali residents must abandon the town and leave their houses to be populated by English subjects. And here is how Foisau concludes. Now, in my opinion, it is very sad to reflect on the fate of those great burghers and their noble wives and their handsome children, who with their forefathers had been living for generations in Calais. There were many such on the day when it fell. It was harrowing for them they have to abandon their fine houses, their estates, their furniture and possessions, for they could take nothing away 
as they received no restitution or compensation from the king of France, for whose sake they had lost everything. I will say no more about them. Now, so that's the, that's the story told by Froissart. And I, wanted, I think there are a few interesting things to say before we continue. First, the heroine of the story is obviously the English queen, Philippa, which might surprise the reader since uh, uh, Philippa is uh, French. But Froissart was French, and Philippa was French, and she came from the same region as Froissart, and she was, in fact, his patron uh, during a certain point in his life. So it makes sense that Froissart would highlight the clemency of the queen. Second, we should note that the motivation of the burger sacrifice, as stated by Eustache de Saint-Pierre, the one who comes forward the first, is not simply to save his other uh, townsfolk, but to receive pardon for his sins. So what inspires Eustache in this story is a sense of Christian charity. He doesn't really mention an allegiance to the French king or a sense of duty to the state other than to the town of Calais. And that's important for reasons we'll see in a minute. Finally, one other thing I think we should note with this story is that with the evacuation of Calais at the very end, leaving and abandoning possessions, these townspeople become refugees. They need to take the possessions they can carry with them, abandoning all the rest, and they leave on foot with the hope that they'll be welcomed by another town. And that's important because, as we'll see right now, Calais is actually a hub for uh, refugees. But more on that later. Now, my, qu my question is, should we believe Poissau's account of these events? This is a manuscript. Uh, this is one manuscript of uh, this particular history of France. And here we have uh, an illustration of the particular episode uh, that I've just uh, talked about. Well, it, it may be a beautiful story, but is it true? A couple of things. Poissau did not have first-hand knowledge of the Calais battle. He was only 10 years old when it happened. He gathered his information from interviews with combatants who had participated in, the, in Edward III's French campaign. So these were interviews he conducted decades after the events. There is no question that the English defeated Calais after a long siege, and that many of the residents of Calais were forced to leave the town so that it could be repopulated with English men and English women. But was there the sacrifice of the burghers? What makes this hard to assess is that other accounts of the defeat of Calais, written at the same time as that of Croissant, does don't mention the story. The surrender of Calais is presented simply as a defeat coming after the blockade of the town and its abandonment by the French king. But there's no indication that there was a negotiation to spare the lives of the residents in exchange for the lives of six volunteers. So no other account gives the speeches that I've uh, shown you in Croissant, or the rancor of the English king, or the intervention of the uh, uh, Queen Philippa. Now, a modern French historian of the Middle Ages argues that the reason why other medieval accounts of the fall of Calais don't mention the Berger story is because, and this is interesting, the ceremony of presenting the keys of the city to a victor in war while wearing halters or rope around the neck, or, and dressed only in simple cloth, that that was a common ritual of the era, and that it did not necessarily signify that the persons wearing the halters were actually at risk of losing their lives. Um, the fact that there are other, and there are other medieval manuscripts and chronicles in which the losing party of a battle comes to the winners wearing a rope around the neck and bearing the keys to the city. So this could alter our understanding of Froissart's version of the events. Did the burghers truly put their lives on the line, or did they simply go through the requisite ceremony of acknowledging the victorious Edward III, knowing that once the ceremony was over, they would return uh, to their families? Did Froissart, in a sense, create a version of the defeat of Calais that falsely suggested the uniqueness of this particular situation in order to demonstrate the extraordinary character of Queen Philippa, who is the savior in Froissart's story, and who is also his uh, patron? Now, even if one accepts the veracity of Froissart's account, 
one must be attentive to the ways that this story was reinterpreted in subsequent centuries. So now I'd like to mention the changes to the Froissart story uh, over time. Um, Froissart wrote in the, expand that a little bit, uh, Froissart wrote in the 14th century, as I mentioned, and by the 16th century, so 200 years later, the story of the burghers of Calais was already being retold by writers and historians, but with a major shift. In these later versions, instead of being motivated by a desire to save their souls, the burghers acted out of a sense of patriotism toward the French king and kingdom. So this is a shift in emphasis, and it can probably be explained by the fact that there was a huge change in French society from the medieval period of Froissart to the uh, Renaissance and later, namely uh, a greater centralization of authority, uh, uh, more uh, uh, monarchic power, uh, less authority to individual regions or, or fiefs. And so, in other words, as France became more and more of a modern nation and less like an agglomeration of different regions or fiefdoms, the burghers of Calais, the story of the burghers of Calais became a symbol of national pride and of Frenchness or a sort of secular heroism more than a religious spirit. And let me give you an example of this uh, from a history of France written in the 17th century. So this is a history written by a historian in the early years of uh, Louis XIV, and this is a historian uh, known as Mézéret, François de Mézéret. And this is how he recounts the speech made by Eustache de Saint-Pierre, the first burger who volunteers his life. Um, so in this version he says, if you want to know who are the six men who seek the glory of dying for their homeland, I will offer myself first. I will be one of them, and if King Edward wishes to use the most cruel torments on me to substitute for the deaths of five others, then I will submit not only to the rope, but also to the breaking wheel, the tongs, and fire. For in such a glorious moment, death is not an agony, but an immortal honor that every courageous man must seek as a reward for his fine deeds. So note how in this version, uh, uh, Eustache de Saint-Pierre has no fear of death, and in fact views the possibility of, of torture as an honor to save his fellow uh, Calais citizens. Just to um, show you the difference, I'll bring back uh, Froissart's version of the of the same speech, and you'll notice how uh, uh, the uh, Froissart version gives so much more uh, importance to the idea of charity, of Christian charity, uh, being an act of great merit in our Savior's eyes, uh, receiving pardon for my sins, and really not talking about the glory of dying for the homeland. So that suggests then the kind of change in, in perspective on this story as the story gets told through the centuries. Let me skip ahead even further into uh, the 19th century. Even after the French monarchy was overthrown in the French Revolution, the use of the burghers of Calais, the story, continued to be used to illustrate patriotic sentiment. And the 19th century was certainly one of the most nationalistic of all, and episodes from France's medieval past were depicted in paintings or statues in order to convey the sense of a national spirit. So here, for example, is a portrait of the patriotic devotion of the six burghers done in the uh, early part of the 19th century. Um, and a bust of Eustache de Saint-Pierre was done, was commissioned by the city of Calais, uh, and here it is um, in 1820. Now, the value of the story symbolizing French national honor in the face of defeat may have been greatest towards the end of the 19th century after uh, a huge defeat of France to uh, Germany in the Franco-Prussian War, which ended in 1871. Due to this defeat, France lost Alsace-Lorraine to Germany and had to pay an indemnity of 5 billion francs. So now we come to Auguste Rodin, for Rodin's most famous works come after this point, after the loss uh, in the Franco-Prussian War. So now let's move to Rodin and talk a bit about his life and how he uh, enters the story 
of the burghers of, uh, of Calais. So Rodin was born in 1840 in Paris, son of a, an office employee. His older sister, whom he adored, uh, died when he was 22. He was a poor student. He was, very, he was really not a very good student in all areas except one, drawing. Um, and uh, from drawing, his parents allowed him to attend an art school, but not the famous Ecole des Beaux-Arts, because that rejected him uh, three times. <laughs> Drawing would prove very important to his sculptural career, and it was at the art school while studying drawing that he discovered sculpture, and then really uh, had a passion for sculpture. Now, after finishing his schooling, he supported himself as a journeyman employed in public works projects, uh, such as repairing monuments or adding ornamental detail to a building's facade, putting molding on a building. Sculptors, much more than painters, depend upon public works to exercise their skill. Painters, uh, uh, portrait painters, one could imagine that a client or a patron would, would ask a, uh, a painter to paint a family portrait or an individual portrait. Sculptors, by contrast, really are not often uh, asked to do something for an individual. They're much more uh, uh, often asked to do something for a, a municipality or some sort of public work. So sculptors really depend upon public works, uh, certainly in this period, more than painters. So therefore, he learned his trade by working in Paris and then later in Brussels on commissions that were authored by more prominent sculptors. He was an apprentice to some, some others. With some money that he saved on his work, he was able to travel to Italy uh, and see Italian sculpture in Florence, Rome, Venice. He met his wife uh, when he was uh, in his 20s. Uh, works in Belgium, visits Italy, and he was particularly taken with the work of Michelangelo. Now, the first work that brought him public attention under his own name was a sculpture that he originally called The Awakening of Humanity, and which was later changed to uh, the Bronze Age. He completed the statue in Brussels, and he later submitted it to an 1877 art exhibition of the French Academy, the annual Salon. And here's what that uh, statue uh, looks like. Now, something about this statue, when he submitted it, so moved its viewers and was considered so uh, uh, powerful that Rodin was actually accused of what's called casting from the life. That is to say, creating a plaster mold directly from the subject's body. Um, and such a technique was considered the antithesis of true sculpture, which sought to interpret nature and not mechanically uh, copy it. So Rodin had to actually prove in some sense that he had not um, made a plaster of an actual uh, young man in, in creating uh, this, uh, this particular uh, statue. Rodin had a number of these uh, controversies throughout his career. This was only the first of several. But he weathered it, and the statue was later purchased by the French government. Another state purchase uh, during the early part of his individual career, when he was no longer working as an apprentice, was uh, a statue of uh, St. John the Baptist. I have two pictures of that. From these successes, he received a commission to do an ornate door for a future museum of the decorative arts. And that commission would be uh, a famous uh, statue, or a famous series of statues called the Gates of Hell, that was based on episodes from Dante's Inferno. It was never actually completed in the sense that he continued to work on it and, uh, and tinker with it, I guess, for much, of his, uh, for much of his career. And it was intended to be the entryway to a, to a museum. So Rodin used episodes from Dante's uh, work about the Inferno to create this, uh, this statue. And some of these statues, or uh, some of the smaller pieces in this larger piece, themselves became individual statues, such as um, the Thinker, uh, which you can see uh, here, and 
the three uh, graces that is the top, that also became a, a, sec a separate one. Okay, so now uh, let's go back. So in, in 1884 then, Rodin had achieved some fame and he felt able to throw his hat in the ring for a competition issued, a competition issued by the city council of Calais to create a monument honoring Eustache de Saint-Pierre, all right? At the time, in 1884, Calais was threatened with the possibility that the town might be subsumed by its neighboring suburb, Saint-Pierre, which had become much more populous due to industrialization. And in fact, Calais had proposed merging with this uh, neighboring city and marking this unity by commissioning a new statue of Eustache de Saint-Pierre. So the town council of Calais selected a special committee to oversee the project and launched an appeal for financial contributions from other cities in France as well as private individuals. Rodin was recommended for the project and he submitted a model of his statue in December 1884. Now this model is known as the first model or the first mock-up, if you will, because he would later change his understanding of the statue. You can see this first model in the Rodin Museum in Paris, and I have a, uh, I have a picture of it, which I think I can also blow up a little bit. Okay, now, as you can see here, Rodin, Rodin rejected the idea of only depicting Eustache de Saint-Pierre, which was, the, in fact, the original idea of the competition. The city leaders had requested a, a statue of the main a burger, uh, but Rodin rejected the, the idea, and what he submitted as for consideration was a statue of uh, several of the burgers. He wanted to show all six of them. He also rejected placing them in a triangle with Eustache at the top, which would have been a more conventional form of presenting a heroic group. Instead, they're all on the same plane. Now, this figure here is uh, intended to be um, Eustache de Saint-Pierre, and you'll note how he has his arm raised, excuse me, no, it's this figure here, that's right. And you'll notice how he has his arm raised in the air as if showing a sign of brave resistance to the English forces. His head is raised as well as is that of the burger on the left, or to the right of him, who holds his arm in a gesture of fraternal solidarity. So they're holding arms together so there's a sense of solidarity, and they appear to be kind of walking in step, um, which I think also suggests uh, their camaraderie. So really, I would say the only sign of tragedy here is in the expression of this figure at the far right, who seems to be overcome by his emotion and is holding his head. Nonetheless, even this uh, uh, character. He's connected to the others by the rope. It seems as if the rope is almost a continuous <laughs> connection between all of that, and that would seem to suggest a sort of bond of unity between them. Uh, it was intended that at the base of the statue there would be other scenes from this historical episode, so the whole thing would, would bring together uh, the, the entire history, and it would be a heroic representation of the burghers, their willingness to die for their country. And that, as we've seen, was the interpretation of the story in the 19th century. So this first mock-up was presented to the town leaders, and it is what won him the commission in January 1885. Seven months later, he presented a second mock-up of the statue, which they had requested. They requested a second model to see how the idea was, uh, was being developed. So the second model was sent in August, and it was quite different from the first. Let me put the two uh, side by side. That's number one, and this is number two. So, in the second model, which can also be viewed at the Rodin Museum, um, this is now Eustache de Saint-Pierre here. Here he is here, and here he is here. Okay. Um, he, both arms are at his side, and his gaze is now focused straight ahead rather than sort of to the sky. Um, his companion to the left no longer holds his arm. He no longer walks at the same pace, but stands separately with a scowl, and his gaze 
uh, going elsewhere. So they are no longer kind of connected in this fraternal uh, embrace as they are here. They're now more sort of separate, each existing in his own uh, world or his own consciousness. And the man on the far right continues to hold his head in despondency, uh, but he's not connected to the others with the, the rope as in the, as in the first one. So in this next version, Rodin seems to have eliminated the heroic solidarity between the burghers, and he's opted instead to portray them with a theme of individual loneliness or even disarray. Needless to say, the Municipal Statute Committee was not happy with this version. Here is a section of their response to Rodin after viewing the statue. This was not how we imagined our glorious citizens going to the camp of the English king. We agree with the artist's decision to avoid giving the characters too arrogant an attitude, but the conspicuous despondency that marks Gustache and his companions does not seem an appropriate representation of the humble and yet sublime devotion of our fellow citizens. They were filled with the grandeur of the action they took and surely approached death not as criminals condemned to the final agony, but as proud martyrs who simply and generously gave their life and upheld the honor of doing so with dignity. So you can see here how they wanted to have the heroism uh, and the heroic representation dying for the country represented. And Rodin chose instead uh, a, a version here that seems to suggest more the, the tragedy and the agony of the individual facing uh, death. And for you to decide which is really more faithful to the story uh, told by Froissart. Now, one could well imagine that the conflict here between the artist and the, the city, it could have festered and it could have resulted in the cancellation of the commission. Indeed, the mayor of Calais said in a letter of September 1885 to Rodin, we cannot continue fundraising until there is a change. But what happened, strangely, to save Rodin was that in February 1886, I think we can go back to the... Um, Monsieur Rodin seems to have gone too far in the forlorn quotes of the man on the right, as well as the posture of the burger on the left. I'm sorry, I uh, omitted this part. So they really... Uh, specified particular changes they wanted to have. Um, here's what happened. In February, the bank that was collecting the funds to pay for the statue went bankrupt. And it was not rescued by the state. As a result, the statue committee disbanded, believing that the statue could not be completed. After all, the money being collected was, just, was not just to pay Rodin, but to pay the foundry where the statue would be cast in bronze. So here's where the story, in a sense, should end. In 1886, the funds, uh, whatever funds have been collected, have been lost in the uh, bankruptcy of the bank. The statute committee has disbanded. Rodin, however, was so emotionally invested in the project that he continued to work on it and to refine the individual figures. He was encouraged to do so by the mayor of Calais, who doggedly worked to find other financing. And during this period, 10 years, 1885 to 1895, Rodin essentially had no boss. He could go in any direction he pleased with the statute because the statute committee had disbanded and it was thought, this is, this is not going to happen. The other thing that's very important here is that during this 10-year period, Rodin's reputation continued to grow and he won other commissions. So his negotiating position with Calais became stronger and stronger. In 1884, 1885, Calais uh, could say, we need a change, this is not what we want. 10 years later, they could hardly demand concessions from an artist considered a national treasure, as he would be by that time. So by the end of this period, when eventually the uh, it was financed. Rodin had time, in a sense, to ensure that his vision of the burghers of Calais would prevail, because he had become, during this time, a much more important uh, artist. And he showed the statue prior to its eventual uh, 
being financed at Calais, he showed it at various points to artists and visitors coming to his Paris studio. So this, for example, was one of the uh, 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 mock-ups being made in 1887. He showed them in a show with his friend Claude Monet, uh, in, a, in a group show with, of Monet and Rodin. He created what we might say today was buzz around the statues and a sense of their artistic merit. Um, so Rodin liked to do just a word on his, uh, his uh, process, and then I suppose we could take a break and come back. He liked to do a preliminary study of any of the statues using a model, uh, a nude model, even if he would eventually clothe the statue. He preferred to begin studying the proportions of the body in the nude and then draping it to see how the clothes would lie. Here's uh, one of the quotes that he, uh, he said. The sight of the human form sustains and stimulates me. I have a boundless admiration for the naked body. I worship it. I tell you flatly, I am totally devoid of ideas when I have nothing to copy. But as soon as I see nature showing me shapes, I find something worth saying worth developing even. Sometimes, looking at a model, you think you've found nothing. Then all at once, a little bit of nature reveals itself. A strip of flesh appears, and this shred of truth conveys the whole truth and enables you to rise at a single bound to the absolute principle of things. So working with models for each of the figures, Rodin developed their individuality and their character. And uh, then, so he showed the three of the full plaster figures in 1887, six of them in 1889, and then this was the final version uh, that was completed um, and was eventually sold to Calais. Now I have more to say about this, but maybe should we take a break? And then uh, we'll come back and I'll say a bit more about the reception of this version uh, in Calais and a bit about Calais today. Thanks. Thank you. We are going to take a 10 minute break. So now, in this the second part, which will be much shorter, let's talk a bit about the final uh, version and its various appearances throughout the world, uh, and then talk a bit about Calais uh, today. So, here is um, the final version that was eventually sold to and um, displayed in Calais. Eustache de Saint Pierre, the 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 most famous figure is the bearded man uh, in the middle. You'll notice his heavy head, his downward gaze, the position of his arms suggesting a slow walk to death. At right is the figure that's identified as Jean Dare, who holds the massive key to the city. And in fact, I was talking with uh, uh, David and Sig about the hands, and Rodin was very, very skilled at doing hands, and so he, he holds the keys to the city. He looks forward with a stoic expression, and his lips are turned downward. At the far left is probably the most famous of the statues, um, a man called Pierre de, de Visson. He's probably the most famous because of the ambiguous but highly evocative gesture of the raised right arm, coupled with his gaze to the ground and his open mouth, we'll see him in a second in, in a different uh, perspective. Is he raising the hand to say goodbye to someone? Is it raised to God to demand protection or to curse his misfortune? His garment seems to be falling off his shoulder, suggesting its raggedness and reinforcing the sense of personal exposure and vulnerability. Now the three burgers who are in the back are harder to see, and indeed, Rodin forces the viewer to move around the statue to view them, so there really is not a single perspective on the work. From our perspective here, uh, you can make out the figure holding his head, which you recall that was even from the original, that gesture. Um, we can hardly see this figure here, who is considered to be the brother uh, of that one, but like the brother, he holds his hand raised in a mysterious gesture. Now, what makes the work so powerful, the reason why I think that it has been talked about, interpreted, commented, is its sense of existential loneliness. 
Each figure seems to be separately dealing with the imminence of death. They may be offering themselves out of a sense of Christian charity, uh, inspired by Froissart's version, or it may be out of a sense of French patriotism, but there seems to be no joy in the sacrifice. And there's no indication in their expressions of any kind of transcendence that they will attain in the future. <coughs> Instead, I would say the figures communicate the illogic of death and the sense of absurd loss that cannot be compensated. So it's very, very powerful. What gives the statue unity, despite the individual isolation of each of the burgers, is through the repetition of the garment, which is similar in many of them. Often it op is opened uh, at the leg. And what also gives it unity is the parallel uh, made by the, the feet. So there is a sense of unity, but at the same time, each seems to be occupying his own space, his own consciousness, his own individual attitude of, um, of facing death. Now, let's return to the story of the unveiling of the statue. Um, it was installed in 1895, a full 11 years after it was commissioned. How was it received? Mixed. Some recognized its beauty, while others found it ugly. One journalist, now here is a, uh, an invitation to the unveiling on uh, uh, the first, second, and third of uh, June 1895, the inauguration of the monument of the bourgeois, bourgeois means burghers of Calais. Uh, they, the Minister of the Interior attended the unveiling and the Minister of Education on Saturday the first of June. So here is a, an invitation to that. And this is where it originally was placed uh, uh, in the city. Now, one journalist satirized the statue by reimagining the dialogue between English King Edward III and the Burgers uh, as follows. I'll free you for now, but you'll be executed later at the hands of Mr. <laughs> So it was not uh, universally uh, liked, and I think in part it was because it challenged, you know, this was a commission by the city to, in a sense, celebrate some of its most famous citizens, and, uh, and yet the tone of the statue is one of sadness and not one of, of heroic glorification. So undoubtedly, uh, it goes against a certain um, interpretation of the story. Now, I'd like to use the, the, the technique of PowerPoint to show you the evolution of each of the six figures from the original model to its final form. I won't be commenting on it, I'll simply be uh, showing it to you and, and you'll get a sense of, of how they evolved. Okay, um, here's the final statue in its current display position in Calais, and this actually reflects more of what Rodin originally wanted. He wanted it to be placed more or less at the level of the viewer and not raised up uh, on a pedestal. This kind of uh, is sort of halfway in between that. It's not totally at the level of the street, but it is uh, 
somewhat close, and it's in front of the uh, Calais uh, uh, City uh, Square, City Council. Do you need to go to Calais to visit it? No! <laughs> the artistic success of this work was so great that Rodin was asked to do other castings of both individual burgers, individual uh, figures, and of the entire group, both for private collectors and for certain museums. Uh, someone during the break said, I think I saw this in London. You did. Yeah, there is a version of, there is a casting of this that is in, uh, uh, I think, right in front of Westminster Hall. And so you can see the full group of the six burgers in uh, Venice, Tokyo, Brussels, Seoul, Copenhagen, London, New York, Philadelphia, Washington, uh, Pasadena, uh, the Norton uh, Simon Museum, uh, and Stanford University. And you can also see one at the Des Moines Art Center. The Des Moines Art Center owns a, um, an early casting, I think this was actually done before the final six were completed together, but the Des Moines Art Center owns an early casting of the, of the uh, figure of Jean de Visson, the one that has his arm raised, and that's in the, the newer building of the Des Moines Art Center on the second floor. So you can see that uh, just uh, down the street in Des Moines. Uh, I promised I would speak about Calais today, so let me conclude by touching on some of the current issues. As we've seen, Calais is a point of departure uh, between England and France. Um, and as of May 1994, it's the place where trains carrying both passengers uh, and trucks, or there's also a, a, an ability for trucks to go under the channel uh, to go to uh, England. So because of that fact, because it's the place where the train and, and, and uh, some uh, uh, truck travel can go, um, it's become a site where individuals seeking to enter England have come hoping to board a train or sneak onto a train or a truck and therefore be transported into England. It's not simply the water of the Dover Strait that blocks them. And here's why. The United Kingdom is not part of what's called the Schengen Agreement, which is the convention that abolished internal border controls within uh, the signatory nations of uh, Western Europe. Um, in other words, you can pass, as you know, if you've been a tourist, you can pass from Belgium to, uh, to Italy, or from Belgium to France, or Italy to France, without passing through uh, visa control. But you cannot do that from France to England, because England did not sign on to that. So, for example, with the Eurostar train, uh, in which passengers board in Paris, or some of them can board in Lille, uh, the train stops in Lille before going under, or they board in London and, and, and go the other direction. Um, in order to uh, make that easier for passport control, the governments of France and England have agreed to have the passport control in the other country. In other words, if you are in France and you're going to London, you will pass through English customs in Paris, down here. You'll pass through English customs in Paris before getting on the train. Likewise, before boarding the train in London, you'll pass through French customs. What that means then is that in Calais, France is responsible for policing England's borders. If you think, if you think about it. Um, and, uh, and that creates a situation where internal immigrants or refugees hoping to go to England get caught in Calais, and the French state feels the responsibility for managing them before their status is determined by England. Um, so whereas um, uh, internal immigrants or, or refugees can, can pass now with, with perhaps greater difficulty, even between Italy and France, there has been the, some attempt to try to uh, create a greater border control. But generally speaking, within the Schengen uh, group, there is no um, uh, visa or, or uh, immediate uh, uh, border control, but there is between France and England, and France has the responsibility 
of doing it for people trying to uh, go into England. So the, uh, the refugees or immigrants who are trying to, to, in some cases, illegally get onto a train or, uh, or a truck to go in, it, it's really up to France to be policing their, um, uh, their, their situation. So this situation's gotten progressively worse with what we now refer to as the refugee crisis. This is the United Nations uh, statistics from 2016 uh, that points out that uh, we have the largest number of displaced uh, people since World War II. Uh, 65 million counted in 2016. About 5 million of those were Syrian, but others from many other places. So, uh, and here is uh, another uh, representation of that. Persons of concern, including refugees, asylum seekers, seekers internally displaced persons, um, and others. It's not simply Syria, though some of it is uh, from Syria. Now, in 2015 and 2016, the arrival of migrants to Calais was so severe that these individuals began living in a makeshift homeless camp that was referred to somewhat pejoratively as the jungle. And here's a slide view of the jungle um, uh, from above. Um, and so here is, as you can see, here's the ferry terminal, here's where, and it's there where the, the, I think the, the tunnel begins, and there are attempts, you see, to, to get onto trucks as they, as they start to go in, and so there's been, uh, you know, giant fencing put up, but this was the area in, in Calais where it, it, there were these makeshift um, uh, tents and, and, uh, and other kinds of uh, structures. Now, uh, refugee rights groups and the French, straight, the French state tried to manage the situation by setting up temporary housing and by negotiating with England. France, to some degree, felt like this was England's problem, not France's problem. Um, and eventually, France decided that the best course was to transfer the refugees to other locations where their status could be determined and to, and to raise uh, the jungle. So this was what the area called the jungle uh, looked like. It was uh, uh, a real problem. And, uh, and the French government eventually decided to raise it and to move those refugees to other locations. This was done in October 2016. Approximately 7,500 individuals were evacuated. Here's a series of headlines that chart uh, the crisis. Now, um, uh, since that destruction of the jungle, the situation is still very tense, and there continue to be migrants coming to Calais uh, seeking entry into England. Who are they? According to some informal analysis, they come largely from Afghanistan, Eritrea, Ethiopia, and Sudan, places marked by war or famine or drought, and places that were once part of the British Empire and where English is one of the uh, spoken languages. Um, why do they want to go to England instead of staying in continental Europe? Well, they perceive, some uh, interviews have been done, and these migrants perceive that the economy of England is stronger than that of France, and that they'll have a better chance of finding a job, even an under-the-table job, in England. Many say that they have family in England, or that they speak English better than other European languages, and they perceive that England will permit them to say, stay and will not send them back uh, to their home country. So that's what's, uh, what is reported to be some of the uh, motivations. It remains a very challenging situation, particularly for the still relatively new French President Emmanuel Macron, who's now going into his second year. He was one of the only uh, candidates in the French presidential election of, of 2017 who openly defended Europe's tradition of accepting refugees. The question of, of uh, refugees and migrants is a very fraught issue in Western Europe, as it is in the United States. Um, and there have certainly been many elections uh, decided, uh, most recently in Italy, 
on this issue where uh, candidates who uh, believe that you know their country is accepting too many or that uh, they are uh, dangerous to the uh, uh, to the national um, uh, peace are, are running campaigns against them and Emmanuel Macron to his credit I would say um, really uh, ran a campaign in which he defended a kind of European tradition of, uh, of accepting refugees, but he has put in place a fairly stringent refugee policy and he's angered many members of his own party. This is from a New York Times article just in January, uh, which he gave in Calais as uh, being the symbolic site of this, uh, of this problem. So uh, Macron's had to deal with uh, showing a certain strength and, and vigilance while also trying to hew to uh, the campaign promises he's made. Now another thing that's really developed just in the last couple of months, which is unrelated per se to the migrants, but that deals with Calais, is Brexit. And the fact that the Brexit deadline for a negotiation is the end of March, barely uh, four months from now. And there's no real sign that uh, a, a deal is going to be uh, concluded. Well, this really affects Calais, um, because Calais is such a huge uh, place where trade occurs with trucks or lorries, if you will, uh, going back and forth and bringing goods from the continent uh, to England. So here's a story in which um, there's some concern as to, well, what's going to happen if, because even though England is not part of the Schengen Agreement with people, it's still part of the um, uh, common uh, market, if you will, with uh, with France and other parts of the Western uh, Europe. So, if that ends on March 29th, and if France uh, needs to put in immediate kind of customs, new customs rules for uh, for trade, it will affect uh, Calais. And here's another. This was from the a British paper, The Guardian, from a couple months ago. Calais after Brexit could be ten times worse than the Irish border. Boss of French Port says customs and sanitary checks could lead to 30 mile tailbacks or uh, 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 backlogs. Um, so um, now I've read something else that suggests that some people in Calais think that uh, Brexit could be useful because it would essentially bring back the concept of duty free. Um, before uh, before uh, some of the uh, current unity was created in the in the European market. English travelers would, would day trippers, if you will, would go to Calais and could buy duty free uh, goods, wine, I suppose. Um, uh, and because of the fact that there were these differences in, in tariffs and duties between the, the two nations, if that system were to come back, then I suppose in some ways Calais might be a place where people would would go for, for duty-free goods that would be more expensive in England. But that seems to be looking for a pretty uh, silver lining in, in what could be, if, if there are no uh, agreement is reached, what could be uh, perhaps a very, uh, a very difficult situation. So uh, Calais, certainly France and England in 2018 are very different places from what they were in 1347, about 650 years ago. Uh, but when the name Calais is evoked today in order to describe people who have suffered from war and now are at the mercy of another power, it's hard not to think back on the episode of the Hundred Years' War that inspired such powerful art. Thank you. Merci. So now we can take questions. We can, and I'll just remind people that I'm here with my trusty microphone, and I'll get to you as soon as I can. And um, if you'd state your name and make your comment or question, that would be great. Hello, Forrest Sherman. Where in, in the 100-year period did this battle take place? Was it the beginning or the middle of the end of it? No, very, very much at the beginning. So the, the, the 100 Years' War, Edward III and, uh, and Philip were the first uh, kings to have this um, uh, conflict over who really had uh, the rights to uh, 
of uh, the, uh, the territory. I mean, going back, and I'm really not a, a medieval historian, but going back, uh, England, of course, uh, for a long period had a, a large territory in what is now today uh, uh, modern France, and that France sort of reconquered um, in the uh, 13th century or 12th century, and the, but but the fact is is that there were uh, there were claims that the English really had title to certain areas, and because there was this succession crisis at the early part of the Hundred Years' War, that's when it, so this was near the beginning. The the second part of or the I suppose the the latter part of the Hundred Years' War in the 15th century is more famous for the episode of Joan of Arc. Um, and that's when the, the Hundred Years' War really became a civil war in France between a sort of a northern section and a, and a southern section, one that was aligned with England and one that was not, and Joan of Arc uh, coming in uh, divinely inspired to help restore the, uh, the French king to his, to his rights. So in a sense, this is the beginning, and then the, the second part, uh, some years later, has the another story other than the Burgers of Calais, which is the Joan of Arc story. Bob Gray here. Uh, David, I wanted to explore your argument about the growing nationhood of the French state yes. through an, uh, an examination of language. I assume that what you translated uh, uh, of that historian, uh, what you translated as homeland was patri. Is that right? Oh, that's a very good question. You're right. I provided translations of all of the uh, of the French works, and I would have to I would have to check. Patri would not have been used in Froissart's work. He would not. I I don't believe. Uh, I, Patry or uh, or uh, would have been come in maybe in the 17th century or later. So yes. Okay, because I was wondering if whatever word was used for homeland right. had previously been used to apply to one city, yes. one's local area. Right. Right. I I I'm sorry that I don't have the original here and I don't have it memorized to be able to. Uh, to say that your your sense is exactly correct. It could be that the term that was used in uh, in Froissart was pays p, p a y s, which which could which today sort of refers to nation, but could mean region or area. Um, uh, pat, patri or to die for for one's nation. In fact, that's the argument of the of the contemporary historian that that really uh, I used a lot in this. Is the, the whole notion of patriotism is a, is a modern uh, notion and not a medieval notion. And patri, you're absolutely right, would not be the word uh, that would be used at the time of uh, the Hundred Years' War. Yes. Hi, Harry. I don't have a question so much as a comment. <clears throat> I kind of giggled at the critics use of the word to execute the Burgess of Calais because of course execute can also mean the making of the peace. Yes, right. <laughs> yes, exactly. I didn't know. Yeah. I wonder yeah, which yeah, one yeah. he meant, but we yeah. probably all know. No, and uh, the fact that at the uh, inauguration that the two um, secretaries, I guess we'd say in American or ministers who were sent, the Minister of the Interior, which is kind of like the Homeland uh, uh, Secretary of, uh, sort of, yes, yeah, sec Secretary for the Interior, I guess we would say, or, and uh, Education. That was also a sign that the French state didn't consider this as important to send um, uh, the, uh, the Prime Minister uh, at the time for this. So, I think that there was some skepticism, or at least some uh, official thinking that, okay, this is important, we've got to go. But but there were there were people that uh, that thought that it was uh, a failure as an artistic representation. Well, and, and let me just add to that, Rodin himself had uh, great uh, followers and great critics, uh, so that in fact 
Another one of Rodin's um, most famous statues was a, a, a full-length statue of, of um, uh, Balzac, um, which eventually had to be uh, taken down and was sold to a private collector because it, it was considered to be almost vulgar. Uh, uh, Rodin represented Balzac nude and, and sort of put the emphasis on his big round belly. Um, <laughs> And it was by no means, uh, you know, it was by no means pornographic or anything, but it was considered to be kind of shocking to the sensibilities. And and the uh, the statue was eventually uh, not sold to the. Uh, I think it was supposed to be bought by the city of Paris, and instead it was taken by uh, a private collector. So um, Rodin was controversial enough that. Uh, even things that we would consider successes, there were many people that, that thought that they were not that good. Hi, Gene Wubbles. Uh, I noticed in the 16th century reinterpretation of the history of the Burgers <coughs> that there's a, uh, a commentary that were uh, shown. The uh, first volunteer to uh, uh, the group of six uh, claims that uh, he is uh, willing to die in order to preserve the lives of five others. Yeah. But it's interpreted as those five others, apparently the whole country, or right. the, the, yes. the nation. Yes. Yes. Um, yes. What's, yes. Why is that an That's anomaly a in there? That's a good question. Let's see if should we should uh, try to go back to that particular slide. Go back to a lot of them, I guess. Um, that's a very that's a very good point. Let's see if we can. You know, maybe I should just try to go do it this way. Okay. So he says, if you want to know who are the six men who will seek the glory of dying for their homeland, I will offer myself first. I will be one of them, and if King Edward wishes to use the most cruel torments uh, on me to substitute for the deaths of five others. Well, I think what he's saying there, to be clear, is he's saying, um, I will be one of them, and I can be the one who receives the worst of the, uh, of the punishment to spare the other five volunteers of any other punishment. So I don't think that he's saying, I only wish to save these five others. I think he's saying, I will be the first and use everything you've got on me if that saves the lives of the other five who are volunteering for this mission. I think that's how I would, would see it. So it's not, it's not that he only wishes to save the six, but that he's saying, we're all six going to our deaths. You can, you can exert all of the force on me if I can also save these other five volunteers. Uh, can we talk about this from an engineering point of view? The statue? Yes. We can. You're, you're surpassing my uh, ability to comment, but yes, yes, yes. Okay, but how would Rodin have constructed the markups? Would he have used a frame work and then plastered over the top of it uh, in his depiction of those six people? Yeah. Yes, that's a very good that's a very good point. Yes, that, and I think what you've described is exactly right. That he would begin um, with a uh, with a plaster over a kind of well, no, excuse me. Um, he would start with clay. And he would do a kind of a clay mock-up and then plaster over that. So he would take that creation and then cast it in uh, bronze. Mm -hmm. Nancy Baumgartner. Can we go back to that invitation um, oh, yeah. slide? Um, sure. Unless it is in very small writing that I can't see, I didn't see Rodin's name in there. Anymore. Oh, excellent point. Let's see. 
You're absolutely right. So if he was a darling of the country, somebody didn't use basic advertising <laughs> technique. Well, um, good point, good point. I think maybe this shows um, darling as, a, as an important French artist, but still controversial. Uh, and therefore uh, wanting to put the emphasis on the uh, municipal celebration more so than on the artistic um, interpretation. I think that some of the uh, municipal... Now the mayor of, of Calais, who as I mentioned worked doggedly to secure the financing even after it initially fell through, was a huge uh, Rodin supporter even though he suggested some changes early on. Um, it's my impression from what I read that, that um, when it was finally completed and the financing was finally secured, that, that quite a few of the municipal council felt more obliged to, uh, to Rodin to accept it than particularly enthusiastic about it uh, because of the, um, the tone of the work. Um, you know, I... I um, I think that you can sort of understand that as a this relatively uh, you know small small city in France that this is one of its key uh, historical moments. They um, they're thinking, well, we want to celebrate the bravery of our citizens um, facing the uh, the foreign uh, country, and and bear in mind this is coming after uh, French. Uh, military loss in 1871 to Germany, so the country wanting to show its um, its resilience, its uh, its power, its strength in the face of defeat, and Rodin is giving them um, kind of questioning in the face of defeat, or or almost a sense of resignation, I guess, in the face of defeat. So I I, I wouldn't dismiss the critics as being. Um, fools, I think that one can understand if, if, if Grinnell wanted to uh, memorialize some episode, it would want it to be memorialized in a way that is, um, uh, you know, pleasing or, or um, optimistic, I guess. And uh, many felt that Rodin gave them a pessimistic view of this episode. David, thank you so much. Well, actually, let me just add one thing. Um, you know what is a, you know what is actually a great parallel to that I think is the Vietnam yeah. Memorial by uh, what's her name uh, Maya Lin. Uh, as you recall, when that was first uh, unveiled, it was it was not necessarily universally well received because it is not a heroic necessarily representation of the sacrifice of the soldiers. It's a very sober uh, um, uh, representation. Uh, it's, it's that V. Uh, some might say that it diminishes the sacrifice that was done. So I think that is actually a good, and I, I believe that there is a subsequent, um, or, or let's say an additional or complementary statue in DC to uh, for the Vietnam vets which has more of a kind of um, uplifting or perhaps more, has a different kind of uh, uh, tone to it. So that would be a good parallel to this in terms of what one wants from a monument to the past, what one receives, and how it is uh, understood. So, David, thank you so much.